Nick, thanks for making the trip out here, man. Hey, man, thanks for having me. It's awesome. Um, how much can I talk about your background as it relates to OGA? I am completely publication review board approved. You know, went through the uh, the six week process that yeah. took six months. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, you can talk about all of it. Oh, I like the part where you said you recruited me because I was one of the top shooters. This is this is true. <laughs> this is true. Actually, uh, uh, Troy was running running training. Troy's great. He was awesome. Troy, Troy's an awesome dude. Uh, just a, a solid down to the earth human, right? Just he is. like doesn't get doesn't get impressed really by anything. Yeah. Doesn't also it it just I don't know his his like normal flow of just daily life is just like stoic at all the time. I right? love it. And so yeah, I was running um can't say exactly where, uh but you know, running the the team in uh shall we say a country of presidential importance. Mm -hmm. uh, if anybody wants to look it up, it's a a nuclear armed predominantly Islamic country. Mm -hmm. And so it was a no fail mission. Uh, I think you've got some experience with that, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's something that if things go bad, they were not just going to make the news. It was going to build wars. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, leadership allowed me to pick whoever I wanted. I had, uh, which has kind of made a lot of people angry, but it was the situation. And so uh, I didn't have any experienced guys coming out. Now, everybody in that unit was experienced mm -hmm. based on the requirements to get in yeah, and the training and all that. And so... I just, I called Troy and said, hey man, like, who do you got? There's a top guy coming out of TDC. Uh, and he's like, well, this guy, Mike's got the top scores. And I'm like, all right, but can he actually get along with the, the grass eaters at the embassy? Cause that, that's a big issue, right? Mm -hmm. It didn't matter if you were the smartest, strongest, fastest shooter, 51% of the job is getting along with people. Yep. And if you can't get along with people, if you can't act the part, if you can't, uh, kind of associate with what is essentially the culture of a bank, then you're not going to be successful. And Troy was like, yeah, this guy, he'll, uh, he'll get along with people. He's got some JSOC experience doing some similar stuff. He'll be good to go. So I was like, cool. So you made it into the cable. It was, it was awesome, man. It was an awesome rotation, awesome experience. And I, I out of all the jobs I've had, even as an entrepreneur, like I love that job. It was super fun. It was super fun. It was different every day. And the people, like they're, they're, percentage wise, I've never worked with more competent people in that job compared to even every military organization I worked for. We mm -hmm. had, we always had, you always got that guy. So there's the guy exists, mm -hmm. but that, that guy exists less in that organization. And I found every writing partner I had, every TL I had, was super if they weren't if they had like a weird personality kink they at least had some other skill set that made up for it mm -hmm. and so overall the competency and the capability of those guys I, I never felt uncomfortable like you know rolling around you know Yemen with Sean Ryan like I felt capable with these guys yeah yeah and, and that's that was the that was the whole goal of that entire unit was non-linear problem solving right just put a bunch of highly competent dudes in one team, give them arguably enough equipment to be able to solve pretty much any, any problem and then see what problems arise. And some of the stuff that I got approved, uh, cause that was kind of my, something I took pride in was getting ops approved that we all knew we could pull off. Like Greenside hides in the middle of the city, right? Mm -hmm. Things like we can do that. Mm -hmm. But usually you would end up with this risk adverse mentality coming from the staff that would say, oh no, we don't want to do that because we don't really want, we don't really know what any of that means or we don't know how to do that. And so building the trust with the, the chief of station at the time, who's still a very good friend, uh, where he just knew that the team could do it. And so I started, before I showed up, there wasn't like any team training going on, nothing was going on. So we started, uh, I actually got Zeb to basically be, be the, uh, the team daddy for me and just start, start building, you know, team training blocks and all that. Well, then the chief of station saw that and was like, oh, these guys can actually, they can pull some stuff off. And yeah. that, that trust went such a long way that then you had the case officers then coming to me because you know, the, the, the situation was so dangerous from a CT perspective that the TL, the country TL sign off was required on almost all ops outside the wire, mm. which 
talk about controversial. Yeah. Uh, that, that really made the DO upset. So these case officers are coming to me saying, Hey, I want to do this thing. And we would always help them figure out how to get it done, which then let made them go from a, Hey, this is an adversarial group of people that are going to affect my job in a negative way to Holy smokes, this group of this, this team of guys that's going to help us get these operations done is actually going to help get me promoted. Yeah. Make, make us look good. Yeah. And so, so then the, the whole dynamic about three months after I got there and, and just kind of shook out the team. And, and then also with the leadership coming back and saying, Hey, look, you can, you can pick your team. You can do whatever you want. And the stuff that we were doing with the, with, uh, our, um, our BSIS counterparts and all that. I mean, that once those operations started going, then I think headquarters really started to see what, like what true capability could end up looking like. And then that of course attracted better talent from other theaters. And mm -hmm. so you just ended up with this, like this, like positive feedback loop that really, I think helped that unit until of course the agency decided to do what it does and make things worse. But yeah, there's nothing we can do about that. Yeah. Well, it's really cool that, I mean, as a, as a leader in that organization, you got the opportunity to affect change and, and do a lot of good stuff. We, we talked, uh, briefly also about our experiences in Libya together, uh, which crossed over and, and it's crazy reflecting on those things years after it's happened. Um, that a lot of those talents, a lot of those skill sets, a lot of those experiences overall can help you in what you're doing today. And we'll mm -hmm. get into that because Deliver Fund is uh, top of mind as far as this podcast and educating people. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about first the origin story of you and where you started. Sure. You you were a PJ. I was. You, were, you spent a decade in pararescue. There's a lot of people that we mentor at special operations prep courses that want to do PJ and mm -hmm. these kind of uh, high speed air force special operations jobs. How did you get into that program? And what was your overall experience when reflected on it? So the, the how I got into the program is, is interesting. Uh, so I'm 46 years old, mm -hmm. child of the eighties. Mm -hmm. So of course I saw Charlie Sheen in the Navy SEALs movie mm -hmm. and I'm Come like, off the rafters. I'm going to go do that. MP5 SD. Yes. <laughs> MP5 SD. And you know, 50 cal on top of a water tower. Like mm -hmm. that's going to be my new life. And so I went to the Navy recruiter. It's like, Hey, I want to be a, a corpsman in the, in the SEAL teams. And they're like, well, we can't guarantee you a corpsman. You become a SEAL and then you will do your specialty. Or you, you will do what the, what the SEAL teams need you to do. Yeah. And I'm one of those people who have never really cared about the patch. I've cared about like the thing that I was doing, the mission. And I was a ski patroller in high school, uh, not because I was some like magical skier or anything. It's just because I had a lot of grit and I wanted to learn how to ski and my family didn't have a lot of money and that was the way to make that happen. So mm -hmm. they were like, oh, this, this kid will go run up mountains for us. All right, we'll, we'll bring him along. So I'd kind of gotten a taste of that trauma, medical rescue piece. And I thought I wanted to do that in the Navy. And they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, guarantee me corpsman. So one of the Marine Corps was like, Hey, I want to be a force recon medic. They're like, yeah, there's no such thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, all of our, all of our corpsmen are from the Navy. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right, well, I guess this is probably not going to work. And so I went to the army and they're like, well, you can be an 18 Delta. However, you got to do a couple years conventional first. And so I kind of decided that that's probably what I was going to do because it was the best chance of me getting to be, you know, what, People call an 18 Delta, but an 18 Delta, as you know, and for the listeners who don't, like there's only the only 18 Deltas in the world are in the army. If you're a SEAL or a PJ or whatever, and you went to that course, it doesn't mean you're an 18 Delta. It means that you went to the training course, mm -hmm. right? You're a special operations combat medic. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I was walking out of the recruiter's office and I decided I was going to go to the army, probably try to do the Ranger bad thing and then go SF and, you know, kind of that, that traditional pre X-ray uh, path. Yeah. And then, so, uh, the air force recruiter like had seen me in there a couple of times and I'm the only office he never walked into. And so he came out and hit me in the hall and was like, Hey, uh, you know, what are you looking to do as a guy? I want to be a, I want to be a medic in special operations. He said, Oh, what about pararescue? And I said, well, what's that? Oh, right? cause I never heard of it. Wow. Nobody, I mean, nobody had heard of it. In fact, I'm surprised that you actually have people going to these prep courses who want to be PJs because yeah. it's just so, I guess, just understated. Like, just not a lot. It of, is. The Air Force 
the Air Force advertises for people who do things with really expensive machines, mm -hmm. not people who do things on the ground. Mm -hmm. So I'd never heard of it. And he's like, oh, you know, you'd be pararescue. And I was like, I never heard of it, not interested. And then he said the magic words. He said, well. Charlie Sheen? No, he said, <laughs> you probably wouldn't make it anyway. And I was like. He said that? Yeah. He's good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I said, you probably wouldn't, he said, you probably wouldn't make it anyway. And I was like, oh, in the sign me up arrogance of my youth, I was like, tell me more. And then he explained that I was going to go to Halo school. I was going to go to SF uh, combat dive. So mm -hmm. I went through CDQC and go through all these different courses guaranteed to get your paramedic, you know, to get your SOCOM and all of these other things. And it's really into mountains and mountain rescue. And, you know, there's PJs, all PJs do a lot of that. And so I was like, oh, well, this is actually is a really good fit for me. And mm. that's, then I did kind of a little pre try out and they didn't have at the time what was called GTEP, where you could be guaranteed a pararescue slot, right? Which is like the Air Force's version of the X ray program didn't really exist at the time. And so you had to pick another job. So, oh, my, yeah. So my dad, like the Navy at the time, if you yeah. were to be a SEAL, you had to be a yep. radar technician or something. Yeah. So my dad is in the recruiter's office with me and I'm going to sign the paperwork. He's like, oh, you got to pick a job. The recruiter is. And, um, my, my ASVAB scores meant that kind of pretty much everything was open to me. And I was like, oh, I, I'm going to make it. He's like, no, you have over a 90% chance of not making it. You should probably pick another job. And again, youthful arrogance. I just was like, no other people have a 90% chance of not making it. I'm going to make it. Yeah. And, uh, so my dad's like, Nick, you need, you need to pick a job. All right. I'm fine. I said, just put me down for a mechanic or something. And my dad yeah. was just like, oh man. And I think he just finally had that father moment of, you know, I need to just let him incur the, the pain of his mistakes yeah. And, yeah. and his decisions. And so, yeah, that's how I, that's how I made it in. And then, you know, air force basic training, they come around, who wants to try out for, at the time it was just pararescue and combat control or would go to selection. And if you failed out of selection or out of, out of the in-doc program, then you, and you were a good enough dude, they'd allow you to pick like TACP or SEER or something like yeah. that. But it was just pararescue and combat control. And we selected at the OLH um, on um, Lackland Air Force Base. It was kind of the, we were one of the last classes to be part of that that old school OLH program. What's OLH stand for? Uh, Operating Location Hotel. Mm. Uh, that's the way that the Air Force had kind of divvied up all the different operating locations because, you know, the pararescue and combat control uh, career fields were so small, they couldn't really have their own squadrons or anything like that because yeah. that doesn't make sense when you, you, you know, I mean, think about what it takes to maintain a, an F-16, mm -hmm. right? Just one F-16 much less a whole squadron of them. Mm. So it doesn't like things like double digit million budgets don't really compute in the air force, yeah. right? Cause they, they assume like you left a comma off of your budget. Mm. Uh, and there's no way you can have a squadron with only 90 people because it takes 30 people just to maintain one F 16, right? That's the, that's the way that they think about things. Mm. So, so they called these things operating lo locations and the selection was operating location hotel. So anyway, so went through that and uh, ended up making it. Uh, just kind of, I guess, a lot of grit. Uh, what was the hardest part about the pipeline? I hear combat dive, and I'm familiar with Key West because mm -hmm. I was on a Mare Ops team and failed pull week as a young staff sergeant in, <laughs> in third group um, and decided to go the mountain phase because I, I was better sure. off in the mountains than I was in the water. Um, that seems to attrit a lot of people. What overall was attriting people and what would you find the most difficult? So it was just, it, it was uh, a selection because uh, pararescue selection is a water-based selection. Mm. Uh, so you do all the land stuff, but you're spending anywhere from four to six hours a day in the pool. Oh, wow. Doing drown proofing. And I mean, uh, everything. Practicing that, for the for the CQ or for the actual combat dive. So pool? it's essentially, think of pararescue selection as a pre-dive course, oh, wow. yeah. right? So okay. it's like BUDS phase one. Yeah. PJ selection, kind of the same thing. Um, you have to meet all of the Navy dive standards coming out of that pre-dive selection. So all the drown proofing, the buddy breathing, the knots, the ditch and dawn, like all that stuff. And mm -hmm. so coming out of PJ selection, CDQC was not that big of a deal. Yeah, because you had already been through all of the yeah, and the, the standards gates. the standards at at selection were higher than the selection than the standards at CDQC. Oh wow! So okay. it was like okay, well you've already done this. Yeah. Uh, so at that point it was. 
it, it, I mean, it was hands down. You're the checking the selection block piece to get was, through it and come yeah. dive. And it was it was fun. Selection was fun mm. in a way, in the way that things that suck are fun. Yeah. Uh, so it was fun, but it was also it was something that was so binary, right? You either did or did not swim 50 meters underwater. Yeah. I mean, there, and and there's a certain there's a certain kind of like Zen like mindset that comes with binary standards where yeah. you either do or do not do. You either do the pull ups or you don't. You run the time or you don't. You do the sit ups or I you don't. It. Right. It, there's there's it. something just so kind of calming yeah. because you know exactly what it is that you have to do. And as long as you do that, you're good to go and don't quit. Yeah. Uh, and that was another thing that was interesting was watching people who were smarter, faster and stronger than I could ever hope to be quitting. Yeah. They had probably wouldn't have made it, but they just, they quit. Yeah. The beauty is as you distill that into the bottom of the funnel, you're surrounded with men who are yeah. not only like-minded, but characteristically the nearly the same human being with yeah. all the, with, with all the similar traits that you want. Hey guys, if you know, Phil Kraft survival, if you know, Mike force, if you know me, then you likely know about Montana Knife Company. Montana Knife Company was founded by a buddy of mine, Josh Smith, master bladesmith for 30 years. One of the most experienced knife makers in the country, and he's had no compromise in all the integrity because he's making all of his knives. He's made that decision early on, by the way, to make all of his knives made in the USA, manufactured locally in his home state of Montana. Designed, tested, and built by hunters, Montana Knife Company is a hunting knife company first and foremost. Likely the sharpest knives in the market. I mean, you likely need a bleeding control kit if you're going to own a Montana knife, and that's a good problem to have. They sell out instantaneously. But for the first time in the history of his company, because he's gotten ahead, he has stock of your favorite knives, including the Blackfoot 2.0, the Spigo, or the Stonewall Skinner. And you could save 10% by using MF10. That's Mike Foxtrot 10, MF10, for 10% off your first order at MontanaKnifeCompany.com. What year did you go through selection, and then what does the 10-year run look like for your, your career field? So I was uh, uh, Balls 397 for selection as my class. Mm -hmm. uh, so Pararescue has three, or selection at the time, right? I think things are completely different. So anybody who wants to go into Pararescue, like don't listen to what I'm saying right now because I'm sure it's completely different. But they had three selection classes a year. Went through that, went through the whole pipeline, CDQC, Halo, Jump, um, you know, PJ School, the whole nine yards took about a little over two years. Got your got to our team, and then it was it was really interesting because it was Clinton years. Mm. So I mean, the first time I saw combat was in 1998. Mm. I was deployed into southern uh, into Kuwait, and then we were going into southern Iraq. Mm. And so people don't realize that the special operations community was used a lot during the Clinton years, a yeah. lot. Yeah, right. You had Northern Watch, Southern Watch. Uh, was it Operation Desert Fox, Desert Thunder, right? All those ops All that those were going small on. Skirmishes. Yeah, but there yeah. was never anything like constant, yeah. right? And there was a lot of a lot of boredom. Uh, but the cool thing about Pararescue was the budgets are virtually unlimited, so it was just constant training. So even though there wasn't wars going on, I was still jump under, trips, dive trips, jump tip. Yeah. You know, the, the, uh, the jump and dive trip to, you know, Hawaii over Christmas for all the single guys. Right. I mean, that, that's so awesome. the kind of, it was, it was, it was pretty awesome. Um, working with everything from ODAs to SEAL teams to FBI, HRT to the secret service, right. Just kind of constantly in the mix and all these different things. And one of the things that people have to understand about pararescue is an organic pararescue team outside of the CSAR mission doesn't exist, right? There's not 12 pararescue men who go somewhere, right? You're always embedded with somebody else. Mm. And there's a, a an, an interesting advantage to that because you're the air force guy, mm -hmm. right? So you better you better perform in the top at least 25% of mm. any team that you get attached to. Otherwise they're going to kind of look at you as not being an asset to the team. Mm. And because you're ripping out with different teams every, you know, 90 ish days. So you'd be with an ODA and you show up and guess what? You're the air force guy mm. until you prove yourself. And, uh, you know, 30, 45 days in, it's like, all right, Air Force, you're, you're all right, mm -hmm. right? And then the team really trusts you, and now you're becoming a real asset to the team, and now you rip out. 
go through a training cycle. Now you're getting hooked up with a SEAL team. And guess what? You're the Air Force guy. And so you had to always stay on top of your game. And it was a real driver to, to put in the extra reps, to, to try to be the, the best version of yourself that you could be and be the best PJ that you could be. And you also had to learn to get along with people. Mm. And, you know, one ODA is doing one thing and then another ODA does something completely different. And this ODA tells you that what that ODA is doing is unprofessional and vice versa. And what I kind of learned through all of that is that it actually didn't really matter as long as what you were doing was effective and safe and fast and you were good at that, then it, it really didn't matter. So I would see every, like one team was dedicated high ready. One team was like, high ready is the most unprofessional thing ever. You're gonna be at a, you know, at a depressed low ready. And, and you're getting all of that within 180 days mm. of deployments. Mm. So your ability to be cognitively flexible and learn what that team was doing and then just kind of be a chameleon and, and, and just meld into their SOPs was, was a, that's probably the most important uh, asset that a PJ can bring is just the ability to just show up and shut up and, and learn incredibly rapidly so that they can be an asset to the team. Yeah, fine work. Yeah. Being adaptable. You, so w where did you recognize, because there's, there's always a perception that often becomes a reality with how things are going to be because you see the brochures, you hear all the stories. Mm -hmm. Then there's the reality of what it actually is. And then there becomes moments where you're like, oh, this is what this is. Mm -hmm. And you know, like I remember going through the Q course and I went to the Q course during the uh, invasion of Afghanistan, but remembering watching all the things unfold and thinking I'm missing out and then envisioning I was on the back of a helicopter in combat operations in Afghanistan. And then I remember the moment where I actually was in the back of the helicopter with right. a beard in Afghanistan with an ODA going, oh, I'm here, this right. is it. And then being in my first gunfight going, oh, this is what this is about. Was there a, a moment where you recognize like, okay, th this is why we exist, like most people have in special operations? So there's there's a few, but believe it or not, it was actually during a civilian rescue in mm. the Sandia Mountains. And so- Interesting. Uh, the Because when you're a PJ, again, like you embed with an ODA, you're not in charge of a damn thing. Yeah, you're an enabler for that. Yeah, so like you're, yeah. you are to- you are to embed in that team and be an absolute asset. And there are times when that team will look to you, but it's not like that team is looking to you because they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. They're looking at you to do your job and they're gonna go do their jobs, yeah. right? And that might just be pull security while you work, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever the case may be, but it's, it's something where uh, you're in an environment with like-minded, well-trained people who all know what their job is. You've been training together, you've been working together. And so you know how things just kind of like, they just work. Yeah. It's hard to explain, but they, it just it just all happens. Now add civilians. So you train civilians. Mm -hmm. Let's say that the, there is no standard to being a civilian. Mm -hmm. And so I was the pararescue representative of the Mountain Rescue Association, uh, which basically meant when the Mountain Rescue Association association in new mexico and i should back up i'd been voluntold at this point to go to the pj school and be the mountain rescue and ropes instructor and weapons instructor out there so part of one of my additional duties was to interface with the civilian rescue community because pretty much any pj team has that person mm -hmm. who who interfaces with everybody in Colorado, it would be the county sheriff right up here as well. But in New Mexico, it's the state police or the mountain mm -hmm. rescue association. And so I was on a rescue. It was actually ended up being fire and rescue uh, magazines, rescue of the year. This guy was climbing and uh, was about 30 feet up a cliff and got uh, a, his arm trapped in a boulder. And the civilians had tried to deal with it didn't really kind of know what to do. They called us, uh, so we showed up. Fire service then starts showing up, state police starts showing up, and all these kind of rescue assets start showing up, and nobody's in charge, and just kind of complete chaos. Meanwhile, this guy's getting compartment syndrome, and they've got a surgeon in route that they're flying in to do a, to amputate his arm on the side of a cliff. 
and they're asking us like, hey, can you set something up so the surgeon can work on the side of a cliff? No problem. It was an easy day for us. <laughs> and so, but all day long, but part of me is like, yeah, I'm not going to let that happen. We're going to get this rock off this, off this guy's arm. We're going to get him down. We're going to save his arm. I don't know how I'm going to do that yet. But we're going to save his arm. So we start, uh, start drilling into the rock, putting bolts into the rock and actually set up a, uh, a hull system. Cause we're going to try to like lever this rock off a little bit. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen ropes when they're reaching their uh, kind of their plastic breaking strength, but the knots will actually start getting little trails of smoke that come out of them and oh, it wow. starts snapping. It almost sounds like, it almost sounds like uh, direct incoming fire, right? Yeah. You get that snap. Uh, that's the rope starts snapping like that inside the knots. And so we started pulling on this rock, uh, massive boulder and the knot starts snapping we see smoke coming out i'm like okay well that's a problem so i get some fire service guys to start bringing up lifting bags but their lifting bags can't can't lift this rock either yeah so uh, i get them to start bringing this up this stuff up and they get there and everybody's looking around and nobody kind of knows what to do hmm. and meanwhile i've got a civilian paramedic who we had lowered down to put an iv in this guy uh, cause compartment syndrome, compartment syndrome is, a like compartment syndrome will kill you. It'll throw you into uh, a cardiac, yeah. give you a cardiac issue. And so we started getting all the right drugs in him and stuff. And, uh, the civilian paramedic is kind of out of his element and I start coordinating everything. And then these state police people start kind of talking to the fire guys and the fire guys are talking to the state police guys and the mountain rescue association guys are talking there. And, uh, one of my guys is trying to coordinate a national guard helo that's coming in and all this stuff is happening. And finally I just was like, wait a minute, this is why I've been told to do this additional duty. And so I finally stood up on this rock and I was like, Hey, I was like, I have control. Mm. And everybody just looked at me and was like, like nobody fought me on it. Yeah. And, uh, they're and like, thank God somebody. Yeah. And I was like, all right, you do this, you do this. We got all this done. And I'm standing on this rock and this civilian paramedic is, I mean, he's pretty freaked out, uh, because we finally lifted this boulder. Uh, but one of the pieces of shoring on the boulder slipped. And so now this rock is basically dangling on knots that are very clearly coming close to breaking. And so I was on this little ledge and I finally, I was just, I'm not roped into anything. Uh, I was wearing a harness, but it wasn't tied into anything and didn't really need to be. It was a safe enough situation. It was a ledge probably about as wide as this, this table. And so finally I just walked over this paramedic and I just grabbed onto him and pushed him away from the rock. And I started walking down with him mm. and people were like, what the heck is this guy doing? But you'd had so much training in pararescue and so much experience that that might seem dangerous yeah. to these civilians. But to me, it was like, yeah, this isn't really that big of a deal. And ended up, ended up getting this guy to the bottom, uh, ended up getting that rock set down on some, uh, some four by four shoring and ended up saving this guy's arm. The guy pulled his arm out. Yeah. So, so we, we got the rock off and so we were able to get his arm out. As soon as we got his arm out, he went unconscious, right? Cause all that acidotic blood hit him. Oh, um, he went unconscious. So now we're like, well, is he like a fibbing out yeah. on the freaking side of this cliff? Like nothing we can do about that. So that's why I, I just jumped on him, pushed him out and was like, all right, we're, we're going down and we got to get this guy down as fast as possible. You started working him. Yeah. Started working him when we got to the bottom. Um, uh, he, he's, he stayed unconscious until we had about a mile walk out. Uh, and he started kind of coming to about a mile in, but he was, I mean, for the most part, fine ended up saving his arm. Crazy. And so that was the issue in instance where it was like, Oh, wait a minute. Like this is, this is why I'm here. Cause a lot of times you're like, why am I here? Yeah. Right. You're with an ODA for two weeks. Nothing happens. You kind of aren't really needed. Yeah. Right. But then there's a couple of guys who are you know, pending medal of honor, um, PJ attachments to some ODAs for some stuff that happened in Afghanistan. You're probably familiar with some of those mm -hmm. ops where it was like, okay, there's now a very, very clear reason why they were there. And I think that's one of the, one of the differences between pararescue and a lot of the other special operations community as a, as an SF operator and with your time in JSOC, you always knew why you were there, mm -hmm. right? There was a very specific mission. Yeah. The pararescue, 
you only are really needed when things go wrong. Yeah. And it's part of one of the reasons I wanted to transition over to the CIA. It was like all we ever did was crisis management. I kind of wanted to see what the crisis prevention side looked like. It's interesting because every single scenario that we've utilized pararescue has been the worst case scenario. And it always is. And we brought them in as the SMEs. In fact, we were very protective at JSOC of keeping them out of the initial fight because mm-hmm. we needed them just in case. In many cases, I'd say several instances that I could remember, especially in Afghanistan, those guys were brought in. And when they were brought in, it was like the guy you needed to save the day. Because we or organically, you have a troop medic and we have mm-hmm. our guys. But when something happens catastrophic, mass casualty or a large scale event, you need the SMEs to come in there and start doing the job. Or just the recovery issue. It's like, yeah. oh, look, we got a guy who's, like, again, bleeding out on the side of a ship, yeah. dangling in midair. Okay, oh. cool. We can do that. You know, like, not, not a big deal. And so that that's where being able to, um, it, and it can be frustrating as a PJ because sometimes you'll be in an assault element and you for whatever reason, right? Just the way the train ends up flowing through a hallway, you end up finding yourself as number one man in the Mm -hmm. stack and you can do that. But can you really do that as well as those assaulters? No way. Mm -hmm. And so, but that's okay. Yeah, You're you're like, oh man, all right, I'm freaking number one man. And then you feel you get bumped back Mm -hmm. because they don't want you in that position. So like, man, if something happens to you, like this is bad. And then one of the things you start to realize as a PJ is you get more experience is like, man, if something happens to me, there is no me to help me. Mm. So, okay, these guys are actually making, even though it, it might make my job a little more boring from time to time, these guys are making the best decision for the overall team and kind of putting me in some bubble wrap on occasion. So, yeah, when I was a team star, I was very protective of my PJs and controllers. Yeah, I was like, yeah. you guys get, <laughs> keep them in the back, protect <laughs> them at all costs. Yeah. Um, you transition kind of, you go to the agency, um, mm-hmm. you have a multitude of experiences, a lot of experience. And then at some point you decide technically to do a startup and mm-hmm. to do something new as a venture, including, is it anti-trafficking? Is that the right terminology? So it's counter human trafficking. Counter human just, trafficking. Just like, so human trafficking, terrorism, same thing, yep. right? Dif- different outcomes, oh, but yeah. mathematically, yeah. same thing. Anybody who's listening to this who knows me knows I'm like the biggest math and economics and like just data nerd that there is. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's kind of the way I tend to look at them. Anti-terrorism and counter-terrorism mm-hmm. are two different things. Yeah. Right. Venn diagram with a little bit of overlap. Mm-hmm. Anti-trafficking and counter-trafficking exactly the same way. Mm-hmm. Anti-trafficking is education awareness, you know, um, helping people to understand what's happening mm. and then counter human trafficking is going countering the act of human trafficking right it's going after the human trafficker and so uh, and the whole thing actually started because i was in lashkar afghanistan and we had working with a, 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 a tfo counterpart and we had what i like to call smoking gun intel mm-hmm. on a on a human trafficker and Long story short, after a period of weeks, it, the write-up never even made it out of station. Question is why? So the question I ask every 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 person with an operational background, so you, very experienced, right? Tons of operational experiences. Do you know, have you ever personally been involved in any target that was involved in, the reason you were going after the, the target was because of human trafficking, child trafficking, anything along those lines? Never. You know tons of operators. Do you know a single one who's ever done anything? Never. Exactly. Mm. Which is weird that you say it out loud because it's like that was happening. So we, but can, we never targeted right. or dealt with that. Every once in a while, you'd be like, oh, here's a guy who makes bombs who also happens to have some like weird fetish for little kids or something, right? Yeah, but it was for sure. Um, those guys usually didn't make it off target. Uh, but, uh, but there was never a like, here is somebody who's exploiting human beings and we're going after them because of that and that was so i'm in lashkar god and i was like wait a minute you know we were safe house in the middle of the city i'm like we can kill people with flying robots from six thousand miles away but nobody's got the ball on this issue hmm. and, and when you look at the like mandatory presidential reporting requirements and all the things that go into figuring out what the the system is supposed to be focusing on 
that's just not there. Mm. And so after a, a lot of reflection, I just kind of realized that, well, wait a minute, this is something that I actually think that I can do something about. And so, so I started Deliver Fund in order to address that very specific problem. I also started a software company. I'd raised venture capital to start a software company. Um, did that, exited that last November. Uh, so I had a bunch of other things going, but this is kind of the thing that I was, it, it was the problem to solve. It was the like, okay, why is nobody doing anything about this? And a lot of people, when you look at human trafficking and it seems, so we started deliver fund in 2014, went operational in April of 2015. And we were the kind of second um, one of the groups that had started to try to do the same thing has had, uh, shall we say, a, a, a rather uh, um, catastrophic failure uh, uh, within the media and some of the stuff that they were doing. But it seems like since we started Deliver Fund, you've had special operators popping up these like, you know, kind of counter trafficking organizations right and left, uh, which is awesome. Like we need lots of them. In fact, if you go to deliverfund.org forward slash OLX, I think it is, or maybe it's olx.deliverfund.org, one of those two. Uh, you can actually sign up. We are launching in Q2 a program to essentially equip, train, and advise teams. No background requirements or anything like that. Um, you got to make it through a background check process and right, you got to be able to actually meet the standards. But we're actually encouraging people to start their own teams mm. where they can then be a essentially a targeting resource for their county sheriff or for their local police or their HSI office and and protect their community. Because one of the things I realized is that no matter how much money Deliver Fund raised, I mean, you give me a billion dollars and I go and hire a bunch of analysts, well, guess what I got to do next year? I got to figure out how to pay those analysts again, right? It's just, it's a it's an issue that we could never possibly get to the bottom of. So we have to engage the whole community. And so we knew we were going to have to do that. Mm. In the early days, we just didn't really understand the human trafficking target set uh, because nobody was doing the work. So we started by embedding with law enforcement. Uh, that started with one law enforcement officer who kind of was like, I'll give you a try because I don't really have any other options to now we work with over 450 law enforcement agencies across the United States, oh, wow. uh, coordinated in one, uh, one, uh, software platform. Uh, so we're really a software and data company. We've built the largest, uh, counter human trafficking database on the planet. Uh, we collect about 250,000 times more data than the department of justice as an example, right? Wow. So like billions of data points at this point, I mean, we own two supercomputers. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are, we are a very, very tech heavy nonprofit. In fact, I would say in the nonprofit space, we're probably the most tech forward nonprofit that is not a hospital or a university. And so people hear my background are like, well, wait a minute, shooter, PJ, agency guy, like now you're supercomputers and AI algorithms. Of course. Well, of course, <laughs> because you get people who are interested in fighting human trafficking I'm not interested in fighting human trafficking. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in winning. And you, in order to win, you have to understand how we ended up with a problem we have. So when I started Deliver Fund, the original thesis was we're going to go help with the human trafficking issue overseas. Mm -hmm. But dollar for dollar, the largest human trafficking market is the United States of America. Mm -hmm. It's happening here. It's happening here to our kids. And for the first time in history, a non-familial 40-year-old man who's a pedophile can contact a 12 year old girl who's 3000 miles away, who just made a TikTok video saying she's mad at her dad for not letting her wear the miniskirt, which at some point is every 12 year old girl. Mm. Hey guys, hot salt from firecracker.farm. Now you guys have seen me use this. I've used this and I'm a big believer in one, getting your electrolytes through any means necessary. Most of you are deficient in salt in the first place. So yeah, there's a health and wellness benefit, but it also makes everything taste better. I use it on my eggs. I use it in my coffee. I use it when I'm camping, when I'm hunting. In the back country, it's great because I can just sprinkle it on my food on the go. And it's really neat, man. I mean, this is a high quality piece of equipment and it's pushing out flavor to the max. If you use Mike Force right now, you could save 15% at firecracker.farm. That's Mike Force, one word, compressed together. Mike Force, one word, compressed together. 
That's 15% off at firecracker.farm. Peace out, guys. So we'll paint the picture for me. How, how big of a, the hardest thing for me to do is wrap my head around how big of an issue this actually is and what it means. What, it, what does it mean when we say we have a, a huge human trafficking problem? Is that people that are being drug across the border mm. by the cartel? So, is it, what is it? Interesting. So myths around human trafficking. Uh, human trafficking is not a Southern border issue. Uh, it happens across the Southern border, uh, but it's, it's like 10% of human trafficking. The major majority of human trafficking is U.S. citizens being trafficked by U.S. citizens to U.S. citizens. That's the, that was the like light bulb moment for me. And, and that's not my opinion. I mean, that's what the DOJ data very, very clearly shows. Uh, another issue around human trafficking is, you know, kids being kidnapped, right? So we all are like, man, we got our ARs and we got our good locks and cameras. And we're waiting for that white van with free candy painted, spray painted on the side to roll through our neighborhood to try to grab our kids. When you look at the data that comes from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, right? So that's the centralized, that's the CTC for missing kids in America. Uh, you find that of their cases in 2022, 0.0001% of those cases were stranger abductions. So to, to put that in terms that people can kind of wrap their minds around, it means that a child being abducted by a stranger has roughly the same chance of being abducted by a stranger as you do being struck by lightning. Interesting. Right? So it's not, it's, it's, it's the thing that we can understand. So we tend to focus on yeah. it. Now, looking at that same data, you find that 92% of the missing kids cases at, according to the national center are what they call endangered runaways. And the major majority of those are a predator contacted a child online, manipulated them, groomed them over a period of months to sometimes even years, and got that child to run away, to participate essentially in their own abduction. Mm. That's the problem. Over a five-year period, the National Center also found that they had an 846% increase in suspected child trafficking cases in just five years. Mm. So now you gotta go, okay, well, why did that happen? Well, it's the internet. If you look at smartphone adoption rates with the, the Facebook app adoption rates, which was really the first social media, algorithmic social media to come along, and the increase in suspected child trafficking cases, you see almost a one-to-one -one correlation. So the reality of human trafficking in America is a predator trying to contact your child through an Xbox, through the chat feature on an Xbox, mm -hmm. or your daughter through Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok or any of these things and manipulate them and groom them into participating in their human trafficking operation, right? So the 16-year-old the girl runs away from home thinking that she's running into the arms of somebody who's going to solve all of her problems, but instead she runs into the arms of the trafficker who now starts selling her off. That's the reality and that's, that's what we're talking about when we talk about human trafficking in America. Where does Deliver Fund come in in the process of getting these law enforcement agencies to, I would say, finish? Are you doing mm -hmm. the finding and fixing, mm -hmm. and there, and then that user interface or the or the the software that you've developed does something to interdict that that potential conversation that's going to take place on these apps? So no, we don't we don't get into the conversations, and I don't think we really want to get into those conversations because there's free speech issues, privacy issues, yeah. right? All that stuff um, that we need to be very careful about because those are very real issues and we really don't want the government using one issue to try to authorize hooks that can be used for something else, yeah. right? So when we look at human trafficking, human trafficking is a market just like any other market. Mm -hmm. And there are points of disruption in every single market, right? We call them points of transaction, right? In the military, we call those lines of communication, mm -hmm. right? But essentially there are points where people can transact. So we attack those points of transaction with data and with intelligence. So on the law enforcement side, I mean, we have we have law enforcement, we have analysts actually embedded in law enforcement. So there's people who say they work with law enforcement, Houston Police Department's a great example. We have an analyst actually embedded in there. Their full-time job is they work with Houston Police Department building target packages on bad guys. That's oh, what they do. Okay. And it's a former 
targeter who's doing that work. So, okay, that's one side of it, but that's not, that's just a little bit of disruption. Now, how do we make it so that traffickers are going to get their bank account seized, right? They can't take payments. So we work with uh, NASDAQ. Verifin is a great example. We work with uh, some publicly traded banks. We work with financial institutions to actually help them screen human traffickers out of their out of their platform. And then we work with like Airbnb is a great example, transportation companies, hotels, motels are all the way up to the social media companies to help them also screen for human trafficking activity. And in fact, we have an app now to take it even farther where individual parents can screen for human trafficking activity within their, within their child's, uh, within their child's network, mm. right? So you go to the app store, you can down, just search deliver fund or HD safeguard, and you can run phone numbers and email addresses against our, what we call a red light database. And that red light database is essentially commercial sex advertisements that we've pulled off of the web by the hundreds of millions. And the thing about, and kind of the Achilles heel of, of the modern human trafficking uh, environment is that the barrier to entry is so low for these human traffickers that it's actually created a lot of market competition. And so they have to advertise online just like any other business in order to make the money that they need to make. Uh, the girls that they put out on the street, they pretty much only put those girls out on the street as punishment. Most of the girls, they advertise them online. Somebody on their way home from work decides he's going to book a date with what he thinks is a prostitute, but there's about an 80% chance it's actually a human trafficking victim. That's underage uh, or just period? So not necessarily, I would say just period. Yeah. Uh, many of them are underage as in like under 18, uh, but you will see like they, girls who started getting trafficked when they were 16 and now they're 22 and they're still being trafficked, right? So kind of once they get into that, Death is usually the only way they get out of that if they are not rescued by law enforcement um, and provided the opportunity to do something different. So you, uh, because these traffickers have to advertise online and they have to do that at a relatively high volume, they have to show the product, they have to give a description of the product, and they have to give a method of contact. Mm. No different than any other e-commerce business. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we exploit that method of contact. So I'll have people say like, wait a minute, how can you sit here and disclose your sources and methods? Like, well, I'll tell you why, because we've created a Hobson's choice for the trafficker. If they want to avoid us, it's really easy. They just don't advertise online, mm. but they can't make any money if they don't advertise online. That's where the women are most exploitable online. That's yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so they're advertising online where they think they're putting up an advertisement booking a girl and then pulling it down before they can be discovered. But they don't understand that we actually are, uh, we're harvesting that data at a rate that they can't counter. Because uh, so this is al algorithm built. Yes. Is this the exit from, this is the software that you develop and then you exited and then you're integrating? Oh no, so that, that was something different. That was a completely different, yeah. that was a, an investment due diligence platform that, yeah. that I built. Um, no, this is, this is very specific with, it's a combination of our own proprietary software and then some, some tech stacks from some different partners. Uh, but when you take that data and you say, all right, this phone number one two three four five six seven eight nine is attached to that commercial sex advertisement that was posted in dallas yesterday that either is or is not a true statement of fact and if that person is trying to open a bank account well that's money laundering under the law so now we can actually disrupt their finances uh if they're trying to get an uber we can Uber can say, sorry, we don't do business with people like you. They're trying to get a hotel. Sorry, we don't do business with people like you. Uh, let's say you want to start, you know, OL uh, Salt Lake City and work with your county sheriff and like start targeting traffickers. Well, that data then also you can use to then figure out who the traffickers in your community are and then provide those as target packages to your law enforcement. And then Facebook can use that same data to uh, to deny accounts and shut down accounts of people who are trying to contact children. So you see how by taking a data approach, you actually, with one central point, you can attack every point of transaction in the market. Uh, and so that's really what we focused on doing is not just fighting human trafficking, but fighting human trafficking at the scale of the problem. Uh, because Nick McKinley by himself is one person who can only do one thing at a time. Uh, 
but if we can leverage technology and data, we can kind of do everything all at once. What people, people say that data is the new oil and that's true. Uh, it is, but oil's useless without refining. Mm. AI is the refinery. Mm. AI is what helps you find the signal that you're looking for so that you can target very, very specific, uh, approaches to countering the activity. And so in our case, we've got, uh, not only the data, but then we've got AI that is helping to make that AI, that data usable to other people. And this is all donor funded. So what we do with law enforcement is 100% free. The training we give them, 100% free. It's 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 what will ultimately make our community safer. Uh, but parents need to understand what the problem is. Right? It's not a southern border issue. It's it's the Xbox. Like you're you're better off as a parent removing the locks from your door of your house than you are like you will still be safer than if you give your child unfettered access to the internet mm -hmm. and that's kind of the message that i'm trying to preach to to anybody who will listen is the internet is the threat so you have to teach your children how to essentially respect the internet just like you would you would teach them how to respect a firearm or a, or a sharp blade right? You've got to, you've got to give them the skills. You've got to give them the tools. And then you have to be knowledgeable to know that when your child is on the internet, any predator can contact them at any time because the internet is essentially their, uh, that's their portal. Mm -hmm. But the algorithms that we have in social media platforms and gaming platforms and everything else, that's essentially the, the, the predator's targeting system that helps them find your child at their most vulnerable time. Do we have a sense of scale of how many, how many girls are involved in this prostitution ring, which it seems like it's abundant and it seems like there's plenty of targets of opportunity. Mm -hmm. what, what are we talking? 10,000, 20,000, hundreds of thousands. So the, National Center, again, best data we have, uh, they estimate roughly 100,000 kids a year. This is just kids, so under the 18. This doesn't include the 20-year-old 20, 20 college girl. Mm. Um, uh, roughly 100,000 a year enter a human trafficking cycle. Of prostitution. Yeah, so, so one of the things I'll address is like the difference between prostitution and human trafficking, right? So all human trafficking is forced labor. Prostitution is when a woman or whoever, for whatever reason, makes the decision to essentially sell themselves and they get to keep the proceeds of the labor, right? So that's that's prostitution. It's a real thing. I don't agree with it. No, we do not need to legalize it. Uh, but that's, that's different than human trafficking. Human trafficking is when somebody is forced, defrauded, or coerced into doing something for the economic benefit of somebody else. Mm. So in rich Western countries, the predominant form of human trafficking tends to be commercial sex in nature. It looks like prostitution, but they're different things. Mm. Versus if you go into, say, Cambodia or Thailand, it's going to be sweatshops, right? That's mm. going to be the predominant form of human trafficking. So, so it's what is it that they're asking that, or not asking, but forcing that victim to do. Because when we talk about human trafficking, we talk about force, fraud, or coercion. But it usually almost always starts with fraud and then turns into coercion and ultimately ends up in force. Mm. And so it's a victim being forced to do something so that somebody else can get paid for that. And this is a, a huge national problem that nobody's obviously paying attention to. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's increasingly affecting rural America. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why our, our traffickers have learned that uh, middle-class girls with good manners and decent educations are make essentially better companions, if you will, for these sickos that are renting them by the hour. And so that has actually become the, 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 the product that the traffickers are targeting the most. They also tend to be the most naive. You know, girl who grows up in inner city Chicago has a whole lot more street smarts mm -hmm. than a girl who grows up in Wolf Point, Montana. And so they're actually targeting rural America and they know that they, that those girls, and I'm, I'm talking about girls predominantly because this is predominantly a, a women and girls issue, but it does affect boys. It's just, unfortunately, boys tend to be pretty young boys who are trafficked are unfortunately very young. Mm.
And so uh, they know that they can get these kids away from their rural community and take them to a big city where they don't know how to navigate. They don't have any network. They don't like they don't know anything about it. And so that becomes a form of control in itself. And so rural America, you know, you like to think that, oh, you know, I live in wherever, you know, middle of nowhere in Nebraska, human trafficking doesn't affect me. And that's exactly what the traffickers want you to think. That stuff is overwhelming. Yeah, it is. It is, but but there's also a real message of hope here, and that yeah. we know how the human trafficking market expanded. We know why it happened. Uh, we're providing solutions for that, and if if we know if we know how something was created, well, then we know how to destroy it. Yeah, I feel like you're using. I mean, you're a super intelligent guy, but all of your experiences, especially in the agency, uh, how we targeted bad guys, very with complexity um academically it is no different yeah it is no different yeah everybody often thinks that targeting is fine fix and finish in the traditional tactical sense mm -hmm. but it's not i mean all the targeters and all the the s2 shops around uh, the military and uh, oga have very complex method and means of, of going after bad guys, including AI, lots of algorithms, technology. Yeah. Everybody wants to talk about, you know, damn net going and killing bin Laden. What about the 10 years of work it took yeah. to tell them what door to kick? Yeah. And, and that's the really hard, really patient stuff. It doesn't make for good movies and it doesn't make for, you know, sexy Instagram videos and stuff, but it, but it's highly, highly effective. And most of your target packages, I'm going to guess, were predominantly coming from some higher somewhere, right? That ultimately ended up filtering down. Yes, every once in a while, you're gonna end up with a target of opportunity that you're gonna pursue based on real time on the ground intel that you, you know, ripped off a, you know, phone on the kitchen table kind of thing. But but for the most part, it's it's part of a larger complex effort. That's what we've never really had. We've had plenty of people who will do the target package piece. We've had plenty of people, law enforcement, who will go out and actually do the rescues, if you will. Um, we've never had a, a systematized and and uh, algorithmic way of fighting human trafficking in the U.S. And so that's what we built. That's yeah, working really well. The way you, I mean, it's easy to find a door kicker who do the thing because mm -hmm. that's the easy part. It is. Um, but to actually build the J3 shop, the operations center to make it happen and to understand the complexity of the network, that's the hard part. And to do that all with software, because the reality is, is that if I, I, I mean, pe people say necessity of the, is the mother of invention. Mm. I completely disagree. Constraint is the mother of invention. Mm. So if I give you a billion dollars, you're gonna solve a problem very differently than if I give you no dollars. So if you look at our traditional ways that we've done things in the CT fight, we have very manual processes mm. uh, that are very people intensive. And that's okay, because we can afford those. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't afford to, take, to, to tackle the problem that way in when it comes to fighting human trafficking in the United States of America. And also we do it for free because law enforcement doesn't have any money. Yeah. So you can't like charge them for this because there's no money to actually extract. So if, if it weren't for our donors, we wouldn't be able to do any of this, but we have to do it in an incredibly efficient way. And that's where technology comes in because our unit economics do not increase every time we help some law enforcement officer. It's actually think of it as like every time we turn the wheel, it actually gets cheaper and cheaper to turn the wheel. Yeah, this is a, a e-commerce business operating at the speed of war. Mm -hmm. You you can't afford to have a sergeant major at a whiteboard. No, um, you won't have an effect, especially at the pace in which this is scaling and right. growing by volume. Where can people go to help deliver fund and get educated on the things that you're talking about? Uh, our website is deliverfund.org. Uh, you can find us at Deliver Fund on all the social media platforms. Uh, and then you, if you're interested in signing up for our OLX program, essentially starting your own targeting cell in your community, you can go to, I believe it's olx.deliverfund.org. Uh, we'll make sure to get you the actual right URL in the, in the show notes, my team will. And, 
and then we've got training courses on our on our site as well so like what is human trafficking you can take a human trafficking 101 course and and you know get an actual certificate for it and that's recognized in all 50 states for you know human trafficking training that with some of the like regulated industries they require that and so we're trying to make it as easy as possible for people to get all the information that they need to be able to actually figure out what this problem is and then what they can do about it i i had an epiphany when you were talking about this ability to build these targeting sales and communities there might be a good tie in between american contingency my, my group that's throughout the nation mm -hmm. that has community built assets where they're leaning heavily on these guys for disaster response with mm -hmm. sheriffs and we have protocols and assurances and training methodology awesome. and potentially integrating that as a tab on American contingency com, maybe for with education in mind, but also training those cells to help. Mm -hmm throughout the country, those American contingency groups. I just had a meeting with the regional directors and you know, all these regions are populating more subgroups that are closely tied to towns, obviously, because they're mm -hmm. pulling together as assets in their community. But that'd be really cool as an asset to bear in your community if you have the ability to do that and support your local law enforcement. Also give them something to do between disasters yeah. to continue to build trust and relationships with law enforcement, uh, law enforcement. We ask too much of our law enforcement officers. We do. We do yeah. way too much. Yeah. They're uh, burdened already. Yeah. Our job as a community is to stand up old West posse style, if you will, mm -hmm. and help our law enforcement officers. And that can be everything from, you know, I mean, helping them with, yes, human trafficking, targeting packages, helping them with disaster response, helping them with, you know, I mean, the, the community is, is, is what made this country great. And it's mm -hmm. what will make this country continue to be resilient. Yeah. Nick, I appreciate you, man. Hey, thanks for, coming thanks for having me. Appreciate yeah. it. Appreciate you guys. Check the show notes down below. If you want more information on it, um, we'll have everything linked down below and I appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks guys.